Now, if I were to ask you to explain to me what a Trojan horse is, what would you tell me? An ancient Greek wooden horse used to deceive the city of Troy? A gift that appears to be really neat, but ends up being something a little nasty? Something that looks good on the outside until you open it up? And it's not. Because the Trojan horse enabled the Greeks to sack Troy, it coined a new saying, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. Now, all these definitions are good and add to our understanding of what a Trojan horse is. But throw out that term, Trojan horse, in our society today, especially <laughs> around a group of young, computer-savvy people, and it means something a little different. For those out there that are not very computer-savvy, a Trojan has become geek lingo for malware or a computer virus. These often come to us in harmless-looking packages as advertising or emails. They suddenly appear as a pop-up ad or some other medium that is targeted at us. You will often see merit messages like, um, is your computer at risk? Or is your computer running slow at startup? Well, run our free security scan. Just give it a try and your computer will be just like new, just as fast as when it came out of the box. Well, if you have a computer and you surf the internet, one of the first lessons you learn is this, beware of geeks bearing gifts. <laughs> if you do open a suspect email or click on an ad that appears harmless, well, it's just like the Trojans opening up their gates and dragging in that wooden horse. It immediately begins to install malicious software on your computer that tracks your surfing habits. It could even damage your computer. It could begin looking for credit card and banking numbers information. And then it forwards that information to its creator who is just waiting clean out your bank account. Things that are not what they appear to be, that is what Jesus is dealing with in this case. People who are different than they appear to be. People who look good on the outside but really maybe are not so good. People who at first glance seem genuine but, but really aren't. And Jesus points to them labels them a hypocrite. Now, when we use that word in our society today, it, it comes with all kinds of negative connotations. However, in Jesus' time, a hypocrite did not have the same kind of negativity attached to it that it does in our world today. In Jesus' day, a hypocrite was merely a, a Greek actor who performed in plays. In that time, women were not allowed on stage, and the roles were all played by men. And men often carried a mask with them or something so that they could quickly change roles. They were not genuine. They were pretending to be something they were not. They were simply role playing. And this explains why Jesus reacted in the way that he did pointed to the religious leaders of his day and said, you're a hypocrite. You don't really care about this person. You are just play acting, pretending to be religious. You care more about your rules and your laws than you do about the welfare of this woman who has walked, stooped over for 18 years. And now it's been healed. You pretend to honor God, but you really don't care that much about honoring God. You are just putting on a show. So everyone will think you are a good religious person. Because of what Jesus said and how he used this term, 
the word hypocrite has become for us a negative label. One that is very often used to describe someone who pretends to be something they are not. Pretends to be religious, but is really not living in a way that is consistent with what their religious faith teaches. They do not come across as being authentic. They look good and they talk good, but they, well, they mislead many. Jesus tells those around him, beware of hypocrites bearing gifts. Their piety and moral talk seem good at first. But their motivation is not to please God, but simply to make themselves look good, look religious. Later, as Matthew reports in chapter 23, Jesus strongly rebukes the religious leaders of his day. He points to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and he says, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make longing prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Chapter 23, verses 13 and 14. You know what the really difficult part about this lesson is for us today? It's difficult because it, it calls us to hold a mirror up to ourselves. It calls us to look at the way that we are living out our faith. Is it possible that we are like one of these malware ads? Do we appear to be something that we are not? Are we genuine Christians in thought, word, and deed? What do our work habits, the things we spend our money on, our charitable giving, or the way that we treat other people say about us? How about our political views? Let me ask this. Do you, do your religious views shape your political views? Or do your political views shape your religious views? What do these behaviors show the unchurched people around us about our faith and our church? I also struggle with these questions myself. And I don't like to talk about it any more than you do. There are certainly areas in my life that I have fallen short. There are behaviors in my life that I need to change, to adjust, so that I can do a better job of representing Christ and the Christian faith. How about you? Why is it that people who are outside the church believe that the church is filled with hypocrites? There was a book that came out a few years back. It was written using, drawing upon a lot of the information gathered by the Barna Pulling Group. I'm sure you're familiar with them. The title of the book is Unchristian. And to sum up what the point of the book is, and the survey results, the opinion of most people who are not Christian believe that professing Christians act very unchristian much of the time. 85% of young people outside of the church say that Christianity is hypocritical, meaning that Christians say one thing but actually do another. In another poll, out of 85% of those polled who claimed to be regenerate or saved Christians, only 15% believed that the lifestyles of Christian people were significantly different than those of secular culture. 
or what a lot of people in our society would call normal. In another Barner survey, a 2007 study showed that the lifestyles of born-again Christians were statistically equivalent to those of non-believers. When they reported their activities over a 30-day period, both groups were equally likely to gamble, steal, fight, use abusive language, get drunk, use illegal drugs, lie, seek revenge, file for a divorce, or listen to gossip. Now, we could make a simpler statement by just saying that there really is no difference statistically between Christians and non-Christians in this country. Now, I find these things very depressing, and I bet you do too. The point, though, is, well, non-believers calling Christians hypocrites is a valid claim. What we say we believe, what we say we should do and how we should live is not what we practice most of the time. So what are we going to do about this? Well, if we have a computer, we have antivirus software on it, and the sole purpose of it is to identify and remove those viruses, worms, trojans, and malware from our computers. And the way it works is that it scans all of the files on our computers, it identifies the offending application, and then it removes it so that it can no longer damage our systems, right? Wouldn't we all benefit from a Christian lifestyle virus scan? How do we get one? Well, first place to start is by opening up the Word and reading, and then listening to our conscience. Do a lifestyle scan, a self-examination. How are we living? Ask yourself this question. How closely am I living by biblical principles in my everyday life? The next thing we can do is ask a family member or a friend that we can trust to be honest with us. If you're married, guess what? I'll bet your spouse will tell you. And then we must listen to what they have to say. Or how about a member of our church? Are we not told that we are to hold one another accountable for how we are living and representing Christ? Why do we tolerate hypocrisy? Do we neglect to point it out because we don't want someone pointing it out in our life? The little things can really matter and make an impression people around us. Remember that every moment of our lives, we are representing Christ, whether we like it or not. Every time we come in contact with someone else, it is a potential evangelistic opportunity, a chance to leave someone with either a good or a bad impression of what a Christian is like. D.L. Moody, the great 19th century evangelist, once said this, where one man reads the Bible, a hundred read you and me. Or in other words, you may be the only Bible that someone else will ever read. You see, our behavior, how we treat one another, matters a great deal. I remember a story that was told to me once by um, someone I don't even remember where it came from, but it was a smaller town that had one restaurant, and the restaurant was a very good restaurant. In fact, because it was the only one in town, when church got out, most all the church people, after church, went and had lunch at the restaurant. But it was getting to the place 
even though it was a busy day where, where the, the uh, owner of the restaurant was really having a difficult time getting his employees to work on Sundays. Anytime he posted a schedule, there was always complaints. No one wanted to work on Sundays. Finally, he called a meeting. He got all his employees together and he said, okay, tell me, what is the problem? Why is it so difficult for me to work a schedule out for Sundays? He asked them, did they, did they want that day off? Did they have religious objections? Did they feel he was being unfair to ask them to work on Sundays? Well, his employees kind of stood there and didn't say much, and finally one of them looked around and he spoke up and he said, the problem is not Sunday. He said, okay, tell me what the problem is. He said, the problem is the people who come into this restaurant on Sundays. He said, they are rude, they are condescending, they don't treat the wait staff with respect and they hardly ever tip. The reason we don't like to work on Sundays is not because it's Sunday, but because of the kind of people we have to deal with. Well, after a few months of fighting the problem, the owner decided it would just be easier to close on Sundays because he just couldn't hardly find anyone that was willing to work. It was just easier to close up than to fight with his employees. Now, I'm not perfect in living my life or following what Christ taught, but I, I do sincerely try to do my best. But just like every other Christian, I'm not perfect. I have had conversations with people who told me the reason they don't go to church is because it's full of hypocrites. And when someone tells me this, I remind them that there's always room for one more. <laughs> In answer to the accusation that the church is full of hypocrites, perhaps we should put us on, out on our church sign that the, no perfect people are allowed in this church. Or it's okay if you're not okay, you will fit right in here. Does it strike anyone a bit ironic that non-church people and Jesus share the same harsh opinions about the Christ? Remember, the only completely safe computer is one that is unplugged from the rest of the world, cut off. Likewise, the only perfect Christian is a dead one. One who cannot do anything wrong. One who is cut off from the world. But yet we are called to be in the world. Not of the world. So we as Christians, as an agent, are we an agent of change in this community? In this little part of the world? Are we changing it, or are we allowing it to change us? Are there changes we need to make in our life, in our lifestyle, so that we might better represent Christ? Here's a suggestion you can try. I challenge you to do this. Um, go out sometime this week to a Christian store someplace. Buy one of those bumper stickers that say, I love Jesus. Or get one of those little fish symbols, you know, the ending foods. Put it on the back of your car. But then what you better do is you better put a note on your rear view mirror reminding you that it's there. Do that. Now, as you drive around, let me ask this. Would it change anything about the way you're driving? Or worse, would it just confirm what a lot of folks already believe about you?
climate. What do we need to do to improve how well we are living out our faith? The Christian principles that Jesus taught. How well are we representing Christ in our church? Where do we need to do better? <coughs> Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for all that you did to teach us, the examples that you gave to us in your life. Lord, we are not perfect. We do step our toe. We make mistakes. But you are concerned with our motivation. Are we sincerely trying? our best. Lord, help us in our efforts. 